Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Lawmakers passed a nearly $6 billion transportation funding package last session, and we'll take a look at whether those funds will meet the state's needs for roads, bridges, and transit. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Anyone driving around the state will surely notice that it's road construction season in Minnesota. Joining me in the studio to talk about the transportation funding package passed in the 2017 legislative session is Chair of the House Transportation Committee, Representative Paul Torkelson. Welcome. Nice to be here this afternoon. One of the successes this session touted by Republican leaders is the transportation funding package. What improvements generally will Minnesotans find? Well, the bill authorizes uh, over $6 billion in transportation spending in the next biennium. Uh, you mentioned uh, orange cones in your introduction. Mm -hmm. Of course, people uh, don't like construction when it's happening, but they sure want to see it happen. And these uh, resources that will be available to uh, not only Department of Transportation, but other departments, will see a number of projects moving forward in the next biennium. How will Greater Minnesota benefit? Are there some big projects going on up yeah, there? Yeah, we did some things that are particularly good for Greater Minnesota. One is the local bridge fund, which has normally been funded in the bonding bill, has been rolled into the transportation bill. That means that it's going to have a predictable stream of funding. Uh, those local bridges are, there are hundreds of them across the state. Uh, that list is constantly upgrading and updating, and so we'll be able to depend on getting a bunch of those local bridge projects done. Uh, we have money again for small cities, uh, cities under 5,000 to help them with their street work, uh, and money for counties and townships. So it's, uh, it's, this is a broad-based bill that should help all parts of Minnesota. And what parts can the metro area look for? Well, certainly uh, we put a bunch of money into the corridors of commerce, which traditionally has been divided half and half between the metro area and greater Minnesota. So some of those projects that have been kind of languishing uh, should uh, move up the line is both uh, both in the metro area and greater Minnesota that fit the corridors of commerce criteria. At the end of session when you and other leaders were preparing to fly around the state you also um, excitedly talked about funding for airports. What's happening with airports? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, we're fortunate to have had a balance in the airport fund and we were able to authorize a number of projects uh, in Duluth. Uh, for instance, the runway needs to be rebuilt. Uh, Duluth is really a very important airport facility. That We have the fighter wing there. We have Cirrus uh, manufacturing there for airplanes. And we have commercial service. And that runway needed upgrading. We had enough money to do that. A couple of other projects, one in Rochester that's going to bring the security, uh, international security into the airport building. Uh, we're pretty excited that uh, the airports are also uh, benefiting from this bill. There was some controversy during the session, as it seems there often is, over funding for transit. How did that end up working out? Well, we got up to a good size number for the next biennium with transit. Uh, there's a number of things in transit that are kind of in the works. Uh, and those who are familiar with CTIB, uh, the County Transportation Improvement Board that affects the five counties here in the metro area, that's dissolving. Uh, that will allow those counties to, if they choose to, to raise additional a sales tax uh, funds and both Ham Hennepin and Ramsey have already authorized that change since session uh, was over. That generates millions of dollars uh, for those uh, counties that choose to do that to here in the metro area. So that's going to change the equation for transit funding. Uh, we know that we have a challenge uh, in the out years with transit uh, and one of the big challenges actually is metro mobility, the system that uh, provides rides for those who can't otherwise utilize uh, the metro transit system, um, the costs for that have been skyrocketing, and it's one of those things we're going to have to take a close look at. It's been uh, reported that the labor market is tightening, well reported, I think everybody agrees, um, and studies show that millennials prefer uh, trains and buses and bike paths more to the traditional transport by cars. With the tightening of the labor market and the need to attract this millennial talent, what are your thoughts on that in terms of how we plan for city growth and, and moving people around? Well, resources are always limited, so we have to use our resources as effectively as we possibly can. Uh, some projects carry very large price tags and, and service a relatively small number of people. 
Um, we have to question those, I think. Uh, we've been questioning those, uh, and we will continue to. On the other hand, um, there is a, a change uh, in our metropolitan areas. We've seen an increase in population in our core metropolitan areas here in Minnesota for the first time in a long time, a higher increase than in other parts of the state. So we need to react to that, I think, but uh, we need to do it in a way where we use our resources effectively and uh, reach as many people as we can. Uh, some people have been critical of this transportation funding package, uh, saying that it consists too much of one-time funding instead of a dedicated funding stream like increasing the gas tax or something. Where do you fall on this argument that seems to be continual? Well, we did uh, utilize uh, sales taxes on auto parts and repairs. Um, I think there will be some conversations in the future about whether or not we can dedicate those resources to transportation, either constitutionally or statutorily. I am happy to consider that effort. I think it is appropriate. On the other hand, I don't see anything wrong with using general fund for transportation. Transportation is a priority for the state of Minnesota. It's in the Constitution, um, and transportation needs to fight for its part, piece of the pie, thank you, excuse me, for its piece of the pie when it comes to state funding, just like any other budget area. Um, uh, we're happy to have dedicated funds, but we don't need to rely on them solely. One last question. There was an op-ed not long ago by an Olmsted County board member in the Rochester Post Bulletin that uh, said that state and county governments are having to increase their wheelage taxes and local option sales taxes to pay for their roads because transportation has been underfunded for some time. Is that an appropriate course of action for local governments to take when things aren't getting funded as they, they're needed? Well, that option was available to, to counties. It was made available by the legislature, so I guess that does certainly make it appropriate. It's also one of the reasons I resisted raising tab fees this year, because those wheelage taxes really act like an additional tab fee when you go to register your vehicle. Uh, we have high tab fees already in the state of Minnesota. To increase them dramatically didn't seem like the right answer to me. Uh, resources in the future are going to be an ongoing question. Whether gas tax or some other source is needed uh, is a question we need to ask and answer. It's controversial. Uh, raising any tax is controversial and that's appropriate. We shouldn't raise taxes unless we know exactly that there is a need that cannot be, we cannot avoid raising taxes. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on our neighboring states, uh, surrounding states, and a number of states in our region have raised gas tax. Uh, other states across the country have raised gas tax. It's important that we be competitive. Uh, we don't want our gas tax to exceed our neighbors because that drives away business. So uh, we'll be continuing to look at those, uh, those numbers, uh, and I'm sure there will be others uh, that will be pressuring us to consider a gas tax. Um, I try to keep an open mind, uh, but uh, be prudent in the process. Representative Torvalson, I want to thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. This week, the Department of Commerce released rates for the 2018 individual and small group health insurance market, impacting about 170,000 Minnesotans. Republican leaders praised the passage of the reinsurance plan for the stabilization of the rates. We are so fortunate that the market stabilization tool we put in session, put in last session, um, is working. This time last year, Commissioner Rothman and those of us who are in public policy knew that the individual market was at risk of collapsing. And so that's why we prioritized rebates in January and reinsurance shortly thereafter. And it is the reinsurance program that is showing real impact on rates in the individual market. That's essential for Main Street, Minnesota. Our farmers, our small business owners, those are trying to start out in the entrepreneurial spirit, need to see relief in their insurance costs. And this is the beginning. We have a lot more reforms to do. All of us are watching Washington, but we're not going to wait here in Minnesota. We're going to continue to build on the good work, the bipartisan work that was done in this last session. This isn't a permanent solution, and it's not something we ever intended to be a permanent solution. It was intended to be a, a stopgap to, to kind of stabilize the marketplace, and we hope that it has done that. There's many states uh, where insurers have been leaving the marketplace. Uh, with this provision, every insurer has stayed in the marketplace, which we think is a, a good thing for Minnesotans. The Commerce Department was instrumental in structuring this reinsurance bill and moving forward the waiver. So saying the governor opposed this, he didn't agree with it, it wasn't his path, 
but certainly there were bipartisan votes in both bodies because this is common sense stabilization. Those of you who've been around for a while remember MSHA, which was dissolved under the Dayton administration. It was over $200 million a year in market stabilization. We're simply using the same tools that were in place prior to the ACA to put our market back in a position where our insurance providers can get their legs under them and Minnesotans can get some relief. Now joining me in the studio to provide another point of view on transportation funding and related accomplishments of the 2017 legislative session is the ranking minority member of the Transportation Committee, Senator Scott Dibble. Welcome. Thanks, Shannon. You've repeatedly called for dedicated funding for transportation. What's wrong with using surplus money and one-time funds to fund transportation, as happened partially in this, in this most recent budget? Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with it if you're being honest about uh, using one-time dollars, um, surplus dollars, and uh, helping people understand that that's just, you know, like for one year's worth of getting some transportation done. Um, however, uh, we need to do long-term planning and, and put some money uh, on the table uh, to invest in upgrading our roadway infrastructure and our transit system for the long term. That's clearly what uh, Minnesota needs to respond to its mobility needs to respond to an expanding population, a growing economy. Um, and if we're going to be engaging in that process, it, you have to plan for major capital investments. These are major construction projects. You're asking the private sector to invest in uh, staffing up and in doing uh, a lot of investment in their uh, equipment infrastructure, going to the, to the lending markets and really uh, being able to meet those construction demands over the long term. Um, you know, the typical roadway project takes uh, a number of years. You can't just plunk some money down and get a roadway project done in a year. So, um, sure, you know, using some one-time dollars for a very short-term stopgap uh, measure, but if you're really doing a transportation bill that Minnesota needs, you need to put some permanent funding on the table. How do you win the argument with Minnesotans who are averse to increasing the gas tax or other funding mechanisms that could provide that continued long-term funding, how do you win the argument that this money needs to, to happen? Well, I actually believe that the public is a lot farther in front of where the legislature and legislators are. And um, they understand that um, you know, the, the gas tax that we do pay presently only has 40% of its purchasing value. The last time it was, there was a substantial increase to the gas tax that were fall, falling further and further behind. Um, you know, when, once I mean, I've been all around the state and had these discussions with uh, leaders of local communities, business leaders, county leaders, municipal leaders, um, and they're telling us that our roadway structure in, uh, infrastructure, which is 50 years old, um, they're putting a ton of pressure on their property tax, or things are just simply going unimproved, falling apart. Um, our roadway system is is at the end of its useful life, and um, they, if you do a little investment, you get so much more return for the dollar. And for whatever reason, there's a disconnect between what we're hearing from the public and local leaders and what happens at the legislature. And so you're arguing that more lawmakers need to get behind an initiative for dedicated funding. Right. I think the, the problem is that uh, folks have signed up for a really ideological, doctrinaire, political program of no new taxes, um, thinking that that's where their political future lies. And I think uh, the truth is, is that if you look at the example of 20 some other states around the country, many of which are led, or most of which are led by uh, Republican legislatures and Republican governors, including neighboring states, they've uh, put a little bit more gas tax into their transportation system, as well as some of the other sources, license tab fees, and, and uh, in some cases, motor vehicle sales tax, um, and seen the benefit of those investments and the return to their economy. And, and there has been uh, no political fallout. There's only been actually a favorable political response. People, whenever you ask someone, and, do you support more taxes? They say no. Do you support better roads, better mobility, better transit? They say yes. And when you connect those two, people understand. Uh, a little bit of input, a great output, and you get value for what you're paying for. 
Transportation funding has always been a struggle at the legislature. Um, and so this session, state lawmakers asked the Minnesota Department of Transportation to prepare a report about strategies to reduce congestion and raise revenue, including toll roads. Mm -hmm. So do you support toll roads as a possible way of funding? I possibly support toll roads under certain circumstances and if we understand them uh, correctly. First of all, uh, toll roads in, in no way, shape, or form are the solution to our, our funding needs. Toll roads have a very specific application in very specific places for particular corridors. So, for example, if a particular corridor needs a substantial improvement um, and, and, the, and there's a way to generate those dollars from user fees, which are tolls, um, and uh, there's, you know, there's municipal consent and, um, and uh, people have options and alternatives to paying the toll, um, sure, exploring that idea is, is, has merit. Um, but what happens is tolls are looked to as the funding source, the solution to our transportation problems. Um, that will never happen. And if we're going to be hiding behind tolls as, a, as a, a premise for not doing what needs to be done, keep in mind the bill that was passed by the Republicans only gets to about 10% of the identified need just to maintain, just to maintain our roadway system, to bring it up to uh, standards, much less uh, position ourselves for the future growth in our population, which is going to approach 800,000 to maybe a million more people in Minnesota. Um, that's a substantial amount of pressure on our roadways um, that we can't address with these little drip, drip, drips of, of resources that we're putting into it. Well, and one way to fight congestion, it's argued, is, is light rail as a form mm -hmm. of mass transit. Some opponents are, have said that a social engineering designed to promote an urban vision of dense housing and government uh -huh. uh, transit. The 2016 Republican Party platform said that these initiatives are designed to coerce people out of their cars. Uh -huh. How do you respond in terms of that argument in moving people, especially in denser metropolitan areas? Oh, well, first of all, those are just uh, dog whistle politics, buzzwords designed to agitate uh, the extreme far right of, of the Republican voting base. Uh, so none of that makes any sense. Uh, it's all just buzzwords that are designed to uh, inflame emotion. The fact is, is that um, we need to follow where people want to go. Uh, and the fact is we're losing a millennial population. We're net losing millennial populations. Our demographer tells us that. And when you ask the business community what is their biggest problem in staffing up the, the necessary workforce for the emerging economy, young people, millennials, the creative class, they're talking about where they're choosing to live, which kind of metropolitan areas they want to be in. And those are the metropolitan areas that are investing in quality of life amenities, a fundamental lever for quality of life amenities is a robust and diverse transportation and transit system. So if we want to actually compete on a level playing field with all the other metropolitan areas that are really moving pretty quickly ahead of us uh, in the competitive economy that's emerging for the future, we have to make these kinds of rail, bus, bike, and pedestrian transportation investments. One last question. Uh, we're hearing more and more about autonomous driving or self-driving cars. How will this new emerging technology affect transportation, transportation funding, and the future? Is this something we need to be talking about now? Well, absolutely we do. Um, the, those, uh, those technologies are emerging. It's hard to say exactly how fast they'll be. I think Ford is hoping by 2021. Yeah, I don't think everyone's going to be in an autonomous car, but uh, you know, there's going to be some. You know, we're going to be moving in that direction. I mean, I don't know if the the, the future, the Jetsons, uh, is 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 actually going to come about or not. We need to understand that better. Um, I do think there will continue to be a significant role for transit as we understand it today. Another major aspect of transit, of course, is getting people connected to where the jobs are. People who lack that access. That is what the the major policy intervention we have to get people up and out of poverty and firmly in the middle class long term so that they have family supporting jobs. We have lots of folks in our metropolitan area who don't have access to those jobs in the job rich areas of our metropolitan area. Um, so, um, so transit will continue to be a fundamental investment. Autonomous vehicles um, is going to necessitate changes to how our infrastructure is designed and sometimes mm -hmm. you know, there's um, some thought that the infrastructure itself will have interact activity with the, the automobiles and, and the other vehicles that are moving down the roadway. So narrower lanes, faster throughput, um, those sorts of things. So we have to start thinking about that and start planning for that future too. Senator Dibble, thanks so much.
Thank you. Nearly half a billion dollars will be invested in road and bridge construction as a result of action last session. Those funds will be generated from state surplus and bonding. But there are many ways Minnesota pays for roads, highways, and transit. Producer John Brune explains. Transportation is financed in Minnesota through a series of established funds in the state treasury. Some constitutionally created and some created by statute. State revenue sources are deposited into those funds then distributed to various modes of transportation in the state. The main fund in Minnesota that funds roads is called the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. It's so called because it collects the three main user taxes that fund roads in Minnesota and distributes them to some other funds that go to various uh, types of roads. The three main user taxes are the gas tax, and that is constitutionally dedicated 100% to be deposited into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. The second one is the vehicle registration tax, which is again 100% constitutionally dedicated to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. And the third is the motor vehicle sales tax. That one operates a little differently because only 60% of it is dedicated um, to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. The other 40% is dedicated to a transit assistance fund to fund um, both metro and rural transit systems in Minnesota. So those three main user taxes flow into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, and then there's a constitutional formula that allocates that money out of the fund to state highways and some other local roads. Allocations from the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund are dedicated by the state constitution. The first 5% is set aside and can be directed by the legislature for any of the allowable purposes under the fund. The legislature can change the areas of distribution every six years. Currently, the 5% set aside goes to town roads and bridges and other local turnbacks, which are former state roads being turned back to local control. The remaining 95% of the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund is divided into three funds. 62% is directed into the Trunk Highway Fund. This is the main source of funding for the state highways of Minnesota. The Trunk Highway Fund uses largely our state road construction, operations and maintenance of state highways, um, program delivery for construction or maintenance programs for state highways, um, and also the operations of the Minnesota Department of Transportation so that they can um, operate and fully service these highways. The legislature can also authorize Trunk Highway bonds, which are paid back in future years out of the Trunk Highway Fund using revenues flowing into the fund. 29% of the allocation goes to the County State Aid Highway Fund. This fund provides uh, resources um, to, for the operation and maintenance and construction of County State Aid Highways, which are a collection of key roads in counties. Um, they might have higher traffic volume, they might be regionally important to connect uh, important centers in the county or even inter-county inter roads. The parameters are set in statute. Um, the money again flows out of the County State Aid Highway Fund to particular counties um, by a formula set in statute. The third fund that receives uh, revenues from the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund is the Municipal State Aid Street Fund. Um, and just like the County State Aid Highway Fund, it, um, it funds certain roads in municipalities that have sort of a, a key importance, again, maybe traffic counts, maybe um, large connector routes, things like that. Allocations are limited to those cities in Minnesota with a population of over 5,000. Historically, smaller cities under 5,000 have not had a dedicated source of revenue from state resources. Uh, several years ago, the legislature did enact a new program, the Small Cities Assistance Program, um, and put in an initial funding of $12.5 million for fiscal year 2016. There was no funding for fiscal year 2017, but the program is established and there is an allocation formula in statute now for when that fund receives money. There is a formula for how the small cities are, uh, receive some assistance. Um, otherwise, small cities are largely dependent on you know, local assessments and property tax to fund their own roads. The Transit Assistance Fund and the State Airports Fund provide necessary resources to keep these modes of transportation functioning. 
the Transit Assistance Fund receives uh, revenue from the motor vehicle sales tax, which is split between Metro Transit Systems and Greater Minnesota Transit Systems. It also receives revenue from uh, sales tax and motor vehicle leases, which is dedicated only to Greater Minnesota Transit in the fund. But Transit Systems in Minnesota also receive general fund appropriations in their biennial transportation budget, and that goes to fund their general operations. There's a general fund appropriation made to Metropolitan Council who um, oversees the metro transit system. The general fund appropriation for Greater Minnesota Transit Systems is made to the Department of Transportation, which um, operates it through uh, agreements with local providers through their Office of Transit. The State Airports Fund receives revenues from a number of sources and is then appropriated in the biennial transportation budget to the Department of Transportation and their Office of Aeronautics. Um, to provide resources for the state's airports for um, operations and maintenance, for navigation aids, for um, airport development, maybe adding uh, or improving a hangar, um, runway improvements, things like that. Money from the federal government also plays a significant role in funding Minnesota's transportation needs. Federal dollars may flow directly into certain funds or directly to local governments or to the Department of Transportation. Sometimes these dollars require state or local governments to match the federal contribution in order to receive the funding. Federal funding is a large part of particularly state highway funding in Minnesota. That is a huge source of revenue for the, for the Trunk Highway Fund in particular. Um, federal funds are also used to fund uh, local roads projects state airports projects, and transit projects in the state. Federal dollars flow into the Trunk Highway Fund directly um, and are used as Trunk Highway dollars um, on specific projects. And um, in other ways for, say, local road projects, there might be locals might have to put up a match and to receive some federal dollars, and that could flow directly to the locals. Some of them flow into the Department of Transportation through the state aid office. Great many airport projects also receive federal funding this way and it's set up on a match system with the, what the locals put up, sometimes what the state puts up to match the federal dollars for a specific airport project. And again, that usually flows in either to the local authority on the airport or through the MnDOT's Office of Aeronautics. When it comes to transit, the, the federal government is very involved in um, especially big projects like light rail construction uh, currently in Minnesota. Um, the Federal Transit Administration, when they choose a project that they're going to fund through a state, um, they will pay 50% of the construction cost. And um, in Minnesota, the rest is borne out, the remainder 50% is borne out by the state funds, by local funds, and by the county's Transit Improvement Board, which is a, a joint powers board of several metro counties that collect the sales tax in the metro area and put toward transit projects such as light rail. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.